chapter three. So just a quick review in what we discussed on our Monday lecture. Remember, we start by the second law of thermodynamics, which is a little bit jargon-like, right? Remember, we're talking about any like machine. Um, the the sole purpose of any cyclic machine cannot be transferring heat into work, right? And then we use that raise the question like, what is a machine? What is a heat pump? What is a heat engine? So we then define like, what is a heat engine? And use the second law of thermodynamics to demonstrate that the most efficient heat engine is always the reversible heat engine. With that in hand, we constructed a special cyclic process called Carnot cycle. Right, so with the Carnot cycle, we did the derivation of the entire cycle and find out some of the terms is um, the, the cyclic integral of some of the terms go to zero, hinting that we have a new state function that we find out using the Carnot cycle. Now today, we want to extend our understanding of the Carnot cycle into the more general application. So the first part is trying to generalize our conclusion from the Carnot cycle into any reversible cycle, and then give a firm definition of what is entropy. The rest of this lecture will be using the definition of entropy to say, how do we actually calculate the entropy change in different scenarios? We did that for calculation of enthalpy change, internal energy change, uh, work and heat, and now we're moving on to say, how do we use what we learned to calculate entropy change for different thermodynamic processes? Let me shut the door. So, first goal. Before we talk about um, the, the general reversible cycle, let's do a quick review on what we know about the Carnot cycle. Right? Again, a Carnot cycle is by definition a reversible cycle, meaning the, the cycle can run in any direction. It can go forward, it can go backward, and running in different directions doesn't change the heat or work of the cycle. Now, a reversible cycle that consists two isothermal steps and two adiabatic steps. Now, in our example we did in our last lecture, we start from point one, we run the isothermal expansion followed by an adiabatic temperature drop, an isothermal contraction, and then an adiabatic temperature increase. Now, for this, adia for this kernel cycle, you can also run it from two, three, four, one to have the adiabatic temperature drop first, followed by isothermal contraction, adiabatic temperature increase, and isothermal expansion. So it doesn't matter where you start. It's a cyclic process. And what we find out in our last lecture is by looking at the overall cyclic integral of all the terms, along with our first law of thermodynamics, we find out that this term, the cyclic integral of dq over t, always ends up to be zero for Carnot cycle and let's say perfect gas. It's also true for other systems as well. Now, we have this term that always go to zero in a Carnot cycle. So that's hinting that at least for Carnot cycle, this dq over t term is a new state function. But can we further generalize this conclusion to say like, okay, not only on Carnot cycle, let's imagine instead of having a Carnot cycle, Let's have a, any arbitrary reversible cycle. So let's move on. So this, this whole section is talking about how do we generalize our conclusion from Carnot cycle into any reversible cycle. So on this PV diagram, instead of the four well-defined steps, iso, two isothermal, two adiabatic, now imagine we have a random arbitrary cycle. So the blue paths represent the, the, the cycle, the movement of the cycle on my PV diagram. Right? So each point represents a specific thermodynamic state with a specific P, V, and T. Now in this case, on this diagram, I draw like two different kind of lines on top of my cyclic process. So the gray line here, we call them adiabats. So these are lines that tells us for any processes along these gray lines, they will be adiabatic processes. 
All right, so they don't necessarily to be like parallel to each other, just draw it ADA, um, parallel to each other for demonstration purpose. So notice like on this, on this PV diagram, we can always draw multiple ADA bats. That tells you along these gray lines, the, all processes are adiabatic. And the other one we draw are these green ones. So these green lines are isotherms. So in this case, what we started from is choose four random points on my new arbitrary reversible cycle. Now, when choosing these random points, we manually set them. So A, C, and B, D are on my adiabats. All right, so the other way to put it is my Q, A, C, and my Q, B, D will be adiabatic. And that's something you can just, you can, it, it's pretty well defined, right? It's just drawing adiabats along the curve. And for these points, you can always find intersection of adiabats with our cyclic process. All right, so that's where my A, B, C, D comes from. And then we want to find uh, another line called isotherm. So these green lines are isotherms. So for isotherms, what we're saying is the temperature will remain the same or the change of temperature will be zero for any point along that green line. So in this case, we manually find four more points. So if we focus on AB line, we manually find two points, M and N, so that M and N are on isotherm with each other and then AM and BN are on adiabats. All right. And in the process of finding it, um, we can show that the area under this curve, well, we can set that the area under the curve AM and B are the same as the area under the curve AB. So don't try to prove that area is true. That's just by setup, um, it is true. In my drawing, it might not. This is just an illustration drawing. So these are the setup for constructing my arbitrary reversible cycle, and then using adiabats and isotherms to build some connections that we will use later on. So remember the few things, right? So the uh, C, D, A, B, so these are the points on my reversible cycle. And then we have M, N, and R, S. So these are um, manually installed points so that the area under a, M, and B is the same as the area under A, B. All right, so in this kind of setup, now we're ready to prove that for any arbitrary cycle, our previous defined state function is also going to vanish for any arbitrary cycle. So let's do that together. And if you have any like question and confusion, just like let me know, because this part is a little bit abstract. So let's do this um, together. The first thing we know is when we're trying to get the conclusion that the overall dq over t vanish, we're using our first law of thermodynamics. So for this one, we have delta u, again, equals to q plus w. So let's focus on work first. So since we're looking at a reversible process, my work reversible as an integral of a negative dBb. Or effectively, we're looking at the area below the curve, right? So right now we do not have a mathematical expression for pressure versus volume, but we do have a way to try to find areas below the curve. So in this case, since we manually set the area below A, M, and B, and the area below A, B to be the same, we can see the work for the process A, M, and B must equal to the work of the process A, B. And I hope people in the back can see it. It's a little bit small. Okay. And the same applies to the, the bottom of the figure. So we have the work, uh, let's see, C, R, S, E equals to work, did I see that wrong? This one should be CRSD. 
So that's by the area below the curve. This is by the set. We're, we're estimating that as by the area. Thirdly, we know about the change of internal energy. Now my internal energy is a state function. So that means when we're looking at this change of internal energy between point A, B, and the change of state function between point A, M, and B, these internal energy, the change of internal energy must be the same because my initial state is at point A, my final state is at point B. But the internal energy is a state function, it doesn't care what is the path we take. And then, taking these together with our first law of thermodynamics, we can get, say, delta U AB equals to QAB plus WAB delta U AM and B equals to Q AM and B plus W AM and B. And since we have these two to be equal to each other, my delta U A B and delta U A M and B are the same. We get that my Q A B must equal to Q A M and B. So far so good. Just using my first law of thermodynamics, um, the given condition of the setup, and then the nature of internal energy as a state function. And then in addition, remember we have points along the adiabats. So a few points are along the adiabats. So for example, we know the points A and M are both along the same adiabats. And the same, my B and N are along the same adiabats. So taking together, these two will become zero because there are, adi there are points along my adiabats. Right, so these are adiabatic processes that has no heat transfer. All right, then taking it back to the process we have. So my process Q, A, M, and B is pretty much just say like this is Q, A, M plus Q, M, N plus Q, and B from A to B. And in here we have A, M is zero. We have B, N equals to zero. So my Q, A, B just equals to all right, that's the first part. The second, uh, the sixth point is now looking at the curve we have. In here, what do we have? If we're look, only looking at the cycle created by M, N, S, and R, Thinking about the cycle created by point M, N, S, R. What are the process we have? So M, N is isothermal. N, S is adiabatic. S, R is isothermal. And then R, M is also adiabatic. Remember our definition for a Carnot cycle. It's a reversible cycle consists of two adiabatic and two isothermal processes. Right, so my cycle MNSR is effectively a Carnot cycle. So that means we can use what we derived, which is the cyclic integral growth of EQ MNSR over T equals to zero. And if we write things out, well, again, my MNSR, we have NS being adiabatic, MR being adiabatic, 
So this one just write out as two integrals of the cube. So we have an m or m n sorry over t plus d cube s r over t. Right. And since m n are on the same isotherm, the temperature for my point m and point n must be equal to each other. So let's call it t m n. And this one along the isotherm for SR, we call it TSR. Right, so since temperature is a constant, we can take it out and simplify this expression as 1 over TMN integral of the QMN. Well, let's just write out as QMN plus QSR over TSR. And we demonstrated before that my QAB equals to QMN. The same logic applies to CD and SR. So this term then becomes QAB over TMN plus QCD over TSR. All right. And then the next step we want to do is thinking about our temperature. Now in this diagram, we have a relatively large differences between my um, RS and my CD. But when taking my isotherms uh, and my ADFS, like infinitely close to each other, we can find a, we can make a reasonably assumption that by moving my ADFS, my, by moving my gray line, like infinitely close to each other, the temperature at my RS and the temperature at my CD, or the temperature of my TMN and the temperature of my AB will effectively become the same by moving my ADFX like super close to each other. And then our relationship then becomes QAB over TAB plus QCD over TCD equals to zero. And in here, again, what we have is my AC and BD are along my adiabats. So that's the same as saying my cyclic integral of my dq a b c d over t equals to zero or in, in here when we say q a b these should be like infinitesimally change uh, infinitesimally small and now looking at what we have now we're talking about the cyclic integral of any four points along my cycle, as long as my AC and BD, you can always find ADFS that intersect with my um, PV diagram. Now for this random points, uh, well for these points on a random reversible cycle, we have the cyclic integral of that DQ ABCD over T equals to zero. All right, so what we're doing here is just generalize our conclusion from the Carnot cycle into a random arbitrary reversible cycle. Do we have any questions for this process? Or the other way to put it is when we're doing it when we're doing this process, what we find out is this cyclic integral of dq over t equals to zero for any reversible cycle. 
or to translate the cyclic integral that vanished for the entire cycle, what we are saying is there exists a equation that's dq reversible over t is the differential of a state function. So with me so far, when we're talking about a function being a state function, we're saying this function is independent from its path, right? As long as the initial and final state of this function is the same, the change of this function is going to be zero. Now, by doing this um, derivation, what we find out is there exists a state function that dq reversible over t is a differential of that state function. And we thus define our new state function, entropy. So typically, we write entropy as a big S. So what we have is differential of this state function, entropy dS, equals to the differential of my Q reversible over T. And then the change of entropy delta S equals to S2 minus S1. Or you can write it as the integral between state 1 to state 2 of my dq reversible over t. Now, even if we defined delta S or entropy using our reversible cycle, I want to ask you a question. Imagine now we have a process from state 1 to state 2, an irreversible process between state 1 to state 2. And you have a different path, like the, from state 1 to state 2, you have a reversible path connecting these two states. Will the delta S be the same? Right, so imagine we have this kind of scenario. Now between a state 1 to state 2, see we have an irre irreversible path leading to that change of state. And at the same time, you also build a reversible path leading from state 1 to state 2. Will my entropy change or my delta S be the same or not? So yes, right. So again, we used a reversible cycle to define entropy and demonstrate that entropy must be a state function. Now we know it is a state function. That means for any given initial and final state, my delta S will always be the same. The other question, is my entropy intensive or extensive? You might want to think about, is my heat an intensive or extensive property? And is my temperature an intensive or extensive property? So raise your hand if you think it is extensive. Raise your hand if you think it is intensive. Or, okay, so in this case, is my dq intensive or extensive? So imagine you have heat transfer happening between two substances, right? You have like one more versus 10 more. Will the heat transfer be same or different? So my heat transfer is an extensive property. Temperature is intensive as a result. My delta S is an extensive state function. All right. The other question. 
is my delta, what is the unit for my delta S? Or what is the unit for entropy? You already know that from GenCam, right? But in here, we can derive it again. So the unit for our heat is, is the same as energy. So that's joule. And divided by temperature. So that's joule per Kelvin. And hence, whenever using in this class, whenever you encounter a temperature, uh, always translate, it, translate that temperature into Kelvin. You don't want to make that kind of mistake. All right, so this part gives us a mean to generalize our conclusion from the Carnot cycle into an arbitrary uh, reversible cycle, and we use that arbitrary reversible cycle to define our new state function entropy. Right, so here's a very nice point to quickly pause, because remember in our zeroth law of thermodynamics, saying we have two, one, object one and three in equilibrium with each other, object two and three in thermal equilibrium with each other, then object one and uh, two must be in equ thermal equilibrium with each other. And the state function we use to describe whether or not two systems are in thermal equilibrium with each other is temperature. Right, so we use that zero law of thermodynamics to define temperature. Later on, in our first law of thermodynamics, we went over our derivation and get, well, we didn't really derive it, but we went over our first law of thermodynamics and demonstrate or define the internal energy as a state function. Now, using the second law of thermodynamics, the path a little bit longer, including using the heat engine and our kernel cycle. But at the end, we defined a state function, which is entropy. All right. And now we are ready to talk about how do we calculate entropy? Well, save the ultimate question in what is entropy to our lecture after our uh, midterm exam. So, calculation of entropy changes. So this one is your chapter 3.4. We'll spend the rest of today's lecture and also our next Monday's lecture to finish discussion of calculation of entropy change for different kind of situations. But in general, when we're talking about calculation of entropy change, we need to have several different steps. Like what we did before, when we're calculating entropy, change, which is a state function, or if we write it, we ds is defined as the q reversible over t, or delta s is the integral of the q reversible over t, right? So we know from this definition, we have an idea about like, okay, first of all, we want to identify what is my initial state and what is my final state. So that's in this integral. You must know the initial and final state in order to solve for delta S. Secondly, because we have this reversible term in my heat, in my dq, we need to construct a reversible path between my state 1 to state 2. So that means in the question, it might give you an irreversible process. But in order to calculate the delta S for that irreversible process, do not jump in and calculate heat for that irreversible process because it doesn't make any sense. We want to build a reversible pathway and then calculate heat for that reversible pathway leading to our final state. We'll see some applications in that. And then later on, at the last stage, we're ready to solve for our integral. So let's look at example questions together and see what exactly do we mean by the step one, two, and three. First of all, let's look at some simple ones. Um, a cyclic process. What is the delta S for our cyclic process? Anyone want to take a guess? Yeah, it is zero, right? So S entropy is a state function. So delta S for a cyclic process must be zero. 
And again, as we were saying, whether the cyclic process is reversible or irreversible, that's irrelevant because we already demonstrate my delta S or entropy being a state function. Next up, reversible adiabatic process. So in my kernel cycle, we have two of those processes. And do we know how to calculate my delta S for these reversible adiabatic processes? What is my heat transfer for a reversible process, adiabatic process? So my Q reversible equals to zero. My DQ reversible also equals to zero for that adiabatic process. So naturally, my delta S for the reversible adiabatic process over T, this also equals to zero. So in this question, if we remove the reversible and say, hey, for a general adiabatic process, maybe irreversible, then my delta S is not necessarily always zero. All right, so this statement is only true for reversible adiabatic processes. So let's say if I re now remove my reversible term, only say adiabatic. So I have like say Q irreversible equals to zero. Right? That doesn't necessarily tell me my delta S is zero because I don't know what my DQ reversible is. So be careful with this kind of question. It might appear in like true and false or multiple choice. Next up, reversible phase change at constant temperature and pressure. So in here, I want to highlight uh, the phase change and make a clarification. So when we're saying phase change, what we are saying is a process of like vaporization or a process of freezing, right? So say a cup of water is freeze to become ice. So that process of phase change is um, different from say change of a thermodynamic state, right? So phase change involves say my water freeze into ice. Now the change of thermodynamic means my cup of water, say we heat it up from 20 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius. So these two are different things. So for phase changes, typically we have enthalpy of that phase change. So as, we dem um, as you probably learned in GenChem, we can calculate or we can um, experimentally measure the heat of vaporization, the heat of fusion, et cetera, et cetera. So in this question, we're saying we have a reversible phase change at constant T and P. So that means my delta S, again, is defined by from process 1 to 2. We have dQ reversible over T. Now, for reversible processes, my dQ reversible is happy. We can use whatever we know about Q to solve this integral. Now, at constant T, we can take it out, so it becomes 1 over t between 1 to 2 dq, right? And that becomes 1 over t dq at constant pressure. So what is my qp? So in this case, not dq, sorry, qp. That's after the integration. So what is my qp? at constant pressure. What is my heat transfer at constant pressure? We went over that earlier in chapter two. So remember, when we talk about enthalpy and the physical meaning of enthalpy, we know that at constant P, we have delta H equals to QP. So that tells us in this reversible, phase change at constant temperature and pressure, we have delta S equals to delta H over T. Next up, 
It looks very straightforward, but typically we won't tell you that this process is reversible phase change at constant TP. You'll need to read the question and get that information out. So this is one of the sample questions in your textbook. If we read it, we're saying the heat of vaporization of water at 100 degrees Celsius is 40.66 kilojoule per mole. Or we can write out delta H of vaporization equals to 40.66. The question asks us to find delta S when 5 gram of water, uh, water vapor condenses into liquid at 100 degrees Celsius and 1 atm. So in this problem, we need to read it and say, hey, it specified this process at 100 degrees Celsius and 1 atm, or it's effectively telling us this process is happening at constant T and P. So in this case, we can set up the problem to say, hey, what we want. We want to have delta S equals to delta H over T. Now this one, we want the delta H of condensation. Over temperature. And the delta H of condensation is a negative of the delta H of vaporization. So we have both numbers. So that is negative 40.66 kilojoule per mole over the temperature, which is 100 plus 273. And you can solve that to be negative 109 joule per mole per Kelvin. All right, and knowing that we have five gram of water, that's the same as saying we have like 0.278 more of water. You can calculate the delta S for this 0.278 more of water. Any questions? We're doing good? Okay, sounds good. Next one, we have our reversible isothermal processes. So isothermal, we can rewrite that into constant temperature. And what does that tell us is when we're writing delta S, it equals to the integral of 1 to 2, and then dq reversible over t. Right, so I always like to write this because this is a general expression for my entropy. And then I want to use whatever I know to try to solve this integral. Now in here, we know temperature is a constant, so we did this already, take the temperature out. The integral thus becomes the normal integral of the Q reversible. And that is my Q reversible over temperature. And then this question was transferred into something we already solved. Because for reversible isothermal processes, remember in chapter 2, we went over calculation in how to calculate heat, work, and delta U for an isothermal processes with ideal gases. So one of the questions we could ask you is now imagine an isothermal process of ideal gas. The gas undergoes an isothermal expansion from V1 to V2. Can you calculate the delta S for that isothermal processes? Right, so how do we set up that problem? So we were first talking about ideal gas, isothermal. Let me make more space. Then we have delta U at constant T equals to zero. 
and now we have an expansion from v1 to v2. So we can use our um, w reversible equals to negative PdV integral of negative PdV. And for ideal gases, my pressure is an RT over V dV. Temperature is constant, N is constant, R is constant. We can solve this integral. Now my Q reversible then becomes delta U minus W reversible equals to the integral of an RT over V dV. Right. Once we have the Q reversible, we can um, calculate my delta S. So this T at constant temperature just disappear and thus becomes integral of NR over V dV. All right. So that's just a quick link. So this one looks like simple, but if you think about how do we calculate Q reversible? Now we think about our first law of thermodynamics. We have a way to calculate our work reversible. We know delta U is zero, and hence we have a way to calculate my Q reversible and then my delta S. All right. Next one, let's look at isobaric heating without any phase change. So like what we said, so when we say isobaric heating, now we're talking about change of the thermodynamic state without phase change. So the same logic applies when we look at the isobaric heating. So in this case, we didn't specify it to be reversible. So we need to hypothesize a very slow way, a very slow heating. or reversible heating. So in here, when we're saying like our hypothesis is like a reversible path, for example, I might ask you to say like, how do you build that reversible path? So in this one, it's very straightforward. We're talking about a heating, right? We just like apply heat at very small infinitesimal amount so that the whole process is reversible. But there are other cases that we will see on our next Monday's lecture. You cannot just straightforward say, like, just do it very slowly. It works for some situation. It doesn't work for um, some other ones. So we'll see that later on. Now, in here, we know that isobaric tells us we're at constant pressure. So like what we said, at constant pressure, our dQp equals to dH or CP dT. All right, so again, these are things we discussed before. They should already be on your equation sheet. And then we can write our delta S equals to 1 to 2 dQ reversible over T. That's 1 to 2 CP over T dT. And this is true for constant pressure, no phase change. Again, in our real question, we're not going to tell you this is an isobaric heating without phase change. It's more like this kind of statement. Find delta S when 100 gram of water is reversibly heated from 50 degrees Celsius to 75 degrees Celsius at 1 atm. So in this question, I mean, given the CP of the water, um, the heat capacity of water is constant, and we give you the constant number, we can read the question and say, okay, first of all, we know this is reversible. We're happy. Um, the water is heated from 50 degrees Celsius to 75 degrees Celsius at 1 atm, so there is no phase change, and at constant pressure. Right, so in, in, instead of like giving you, hey, isobaric heating without phase change, you want to read the question and find out this is a isobaric heating uh, without phase change. 
So we can use the equation we just write out, which is delta S equals to T1 to T2 Cp over T dt. Now this question gives us our heat capacity is a constant. So we can solve that integral to become ln T2 minus ln T1 or Cp ln T2 over T1. And then plug in numbers to solve for the final answer. So in this class, when we're grading your worksheet or your exam, if you give me this equation, you'll get like 80% of the grade. If you plug in the number and get the number wrong, that's just going to lose you a little bit of the grade because I know you, you know how to solve the problem, just plug in the calculator wrong. All right. I'm going to pause here because I didn't go over the, the rest of the lecture in my first section. Let's see if we have any questions before we move on. We have like four minutes left. No, we're good? All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Um, so this part is for demonstration. Like this one is like more like conceptually trying to persuade you that um, my state function is not only true for Carnot cycle, but it is also true for any arbitrary equations. It's less likely I ask you to rederive this whole process. Yes. Can you clarify that part where you move the adiabatic like infinitesimally close to each other? Right. So, in here, now, let's see, assuming my adiabats are just um, parallel lines, I'm going to paste another adiabat, no, and then just move it very, 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 very closely. All right, and we just highlight this part where my blue one, which is my path, my cyclic path, and the adiabats getting close to each other. So what is my new A, B, M, and N? So in here, this is my new A and B. They're like on my blue line. And then my M and N will be on my gray line. So when they're infinitesimally close to each other, we cannot distinguish them, their temperature anymore because their pressure and volume will become super similar to each other. Right, imagine, I mean, assuming ideal gas law, our temperature is proportional to the product of pr um, pressure and volume. Right, so in this case, when my pressure and volume of my dots are getting super close to each other, their temperature must be getting infinitesimally close to each other. So that is why we can assume the temperature are the same in this case. All right, if no more questions, I guess I'll see you on Monday. And I'll also stay outside if you have additional questions you want to clarify.